Άρχεται η συνεδρία της υποδοχής του Professor James Watson ως αντεπιστέλλοντος μέλους της Ακαδημίας Αθηνών. Αξιότιμη εκπρόσωπε του Προέδρου της Κυβερνήσεως και Υπουργού Περιβάλλοντος και Ενέργειας κ. Νικόλαε Ταγαρά. Αξιότιμη εκπρόσωπε του Μακαριωτάτου Αρχιεπισκόπου Αθηνών και Πάσης Ελλάδος, Πανασογιολογιότατε, Αρχιμανδύρδη κ. Θεολόγε. Εξοχότατε πρέσβη της Μεγάλης Βρετανίας στην Ελληνική Δημοκρατία, κ. Μάθιου Λόντζ. Αξιότιμες και αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι ακαδημαϊκοί, εκλεκτοί προσκεκλημένοι. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών υποδέχεται σήμερα με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και ευχαρίστηση τον κύριο James Jackson, καθηγητή του Πανεπιστημίου του Cambridge, στο πεδίο των επιστημών της Γης ως αντεπιστέλλον μέλος της Ακαδημίας στο ομώνυμο πεδίο στην πρώτη τάξη των θετικών επιστημών. Uh, I apologize for those who don't speak Greek. Uh, it's my obligation to uh, uh, read the, uh, all what I have to read in Greek. Um, ο καθηγητής uh, James Jackson γεννήθηκε στην Ινδία το 1954, αποφύτησε από το Πανεπιστήμιο του Cambridge το 1976 ως γεωλόγος και έλαβε το διδακτορικό του δίπλωμα από το ίδιο Πανεπιστήμιο το 1980, αναπτύσσοντας στη συνέχεια μια εξαίρετη και ακαδημαϊκή σταδιοδρομία. Η έρευνα του, όπως θα ακούσετε εκτενέστερα αργότερα, αφορά τη γεωφυσική και συγκεκριμένα μελέτησε τους σεισμούς και τις διαδικασίες που παράγουν τα κύρια χαρακτηριστικά της επιφάνειας των υπήρων. Η επιτόπια εργασία του τον οδήγησε σε πολλά μέρη της ορεινής ζώνης Άλπαιων μέχρι Μαλαίων στην Ασία, την Ελλάδα, καθώς την Αφρική, τη Νέα Ζηλανδία, τη Βόρεια Αμερική. Ο καθηγητής Τζάκσον συμμετέχει όλο και περισσότερο στους τρόπους αξιοποίησης των γνώσεων που αποκτούν οι γεωλόγοι για να μειωθεί ο τρομερός κίνδυνος από τους σεισμούς για τους πληθυσμούς στις αναπτυσσόμενες χώρες. Παρακαλώ τον ακαδημαϊκό κύριο Κωνσταντίνο Συνολάκη να προσέρθει στο βήμα και να παρουσιάσει το έργο του νέου συναδέλφου. Θα ακολουθήσει η ομιλία του κυρίου James Jackson με θέμα «How Earthquakes, earthquakes Shape Greece». Προφέσσο Συνολάκης. Σας καλωσορίζω με τη σειρά μου στην τελετή υποδοχής. Δύο λόγια εν περιλήψη. Ο καθηγητής Τζάκσον ανέπτυξε σχεδόν μόνος του τη μελέτη της χρονικής εξάρτησης των ενεργών τεκτονικών διεργασιών. Και θα σας εξηγήσω τι είναι αυτό. Υπάρχουν το πολύ δύο ή τρία άλλα άτομα στον κόσμο που έχουν την ίδια ικανότητα που έχει ο κ. Τζάκσον να συνδυάζουν τα εργαλεία της σεισμολογίας, γεωμορφολογίας γεωλογίας και γεωχρονολογίας που απαιτούνται για τη, μελό... για τη μελέτη της τεκτονικής σε κλίμακες από 10 έως εκατομμύρια χρόνια. Το έργο του στην Ελλάδα έχει παράσχει το βασικό πλαίσιο για την κατανόηση της ενεργού τεκτονικής της χώρας μας και μετά επέκτηνε αυτό το έργο κυρίως στο Ιράν, στην Κίνα και στην Κεντρική Ασία. Από το 2012 ως το 2017 ήταν η επικεφαλής μιας κοινοπραξίας με ονομασία «Σεισμοί χωρίς σύνορα», στόχος της οποίας ήταν η αύξηση της ανθεκτικότητας στους σεισμικούς κινδύνους στις ανεπτυσσόμενες χώρες, όπου το, το ποσοστό θνησιμότητας κυμαίνεται από 10 έως 100 φορές μεγαλύτερο από ό,τι στις ανεπτυγμένες χώρες. Βασικό σκοπό τη κοινοπραξία ήταν η ενημέρωση τη δημόσια πολιτική. Ο καθηγητή Τζάξον δεν ήταν μόνο εμπνευστή και αρχηγό, αλλά έπαιξε σημαντικό ρόλο στο να φέρει στην επιστήμη του πολιτικού. 
Θα σας, δεν σας μιλήσω για τις σπουδέ, γιατί σας ανέφερε ο Πρόεδρος. Ε, θέλω να σας πω μόνο ότι έχει έρθει στην Ελλάδα περίπου 70 φορές. 40 φορές έχει έλθει με τελειόφυτους της γεωλογίας του Cambridge, ώστε να τους διδάξει ενεργό τεκτονική και πώς κανείς μπορεί να διαβάσει το τοπίο. Ο κύριος Jackson είναι από τους λίγους ανθρώπους στον κόσμο που μπορεί να δει ένα τοπογραφικό ανάγλυφο και να σας εξηγήσει πώς δημιουργήθηκε. Έχει λάβει πολλά σημαντικά βραβεία και διακρίσεις. Δεν πρόκειται να σας κάνω μία λίστα. Θα σας αναφέρω μόνο στα τέσσερα πιο σπουδαία. Το 2002 εξελέγει ετέρος της Βασιλικής Ακαδημίας, Fellow of the Royal Society. Εδώ θέλω να σας ανακοινώσω ότι ο συνάδελφός μας, ακαδημαϊκός Άρης Ροζάκης, μόλις εξελέγει ξένος ετέρος της Βασιλικής Ακαδημίας την προηγούμενη εβδομάδα. Το 2014, το Επιστημονικό Συμβούλιο, το Science Council, ανεγνώρισε τον κύριο Τζάκσον σαν ένα από τους 100 πιο σημαντικούς επιστήμονες στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο σε οποιοδήποτε τομέα. Το 2015 ανακηρύχθηκε ε, από τη Βασίλισσα Ελισάβετ διοικητής του Τάγματος της Βρετανικής Αυτοκρατορίας, δηλαδή Commander of the Order of the British Empire. Άλλοι γνωστοί βραβευθέντες, είναι ο Χάρολτ Πίντερ και ο Στίβεν Χόκκιν. Το 2015 του επενεμήθη το μετάλλιο Γούλαστον, το πιο σημαντικό μετάλλιο της γεωλογικής εταιρεία του Λονδίνου. Άλλοι βραβευθέντες με αυτό το μετάλλιο ήταν ο Τσάρλς Ντάρουιν και ο πατέρας της γεωλογίας Τσάρλς Λάιο. Θα σας κάνω λοιπόν μια, ε, μια έτσι, γρήγορη ανασκοπή στο, στο έργο του. Και θέλω σε αυτό το σημείο, αν μπορούμε να δούμε ένα σύντομο βίντεο από, την, από τις έρευνες πεδίου που έχει κάνει ο κύριος Τζάκσον. Εδώ βλέπετε έναν βυρονικό Τζάκσον, ε, πρώτη ήταν από την Ελλάδα, αυτές είναι από το Ιράν. Φαίνεται και αυτή είναι από το Ιράν. Εδώ πρέπει να είναι Κίνα. Εδώ είναι από τη Ρόδο. Έρευνα πεδίου στην Κρήτη. Στην Κρήτη. Και πάλι Κρήτη. 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 Εδώ είναι με τον Φίλιπ Ινγκλανδ που έγινε επιστέλλω μέλο πριν από μερικά χρόνια. Αυτό είναι στην Ρόδο. Εδώ είναι τα Φαλάσσαρνα. Εδώ πρέπει να είναι Φαλάσσαρνα. Εδώ πρέπει να είναι... Εδώ είναι Κρήτη. Στο Ιράν. Εδώ είναι βλέποντα τη Λαμία από ψηλά. Στη Ρόδο. Και στον πάμε στο Ιράν. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Η έρευνα λοιπόν για τι τεκτονικέ πλάκε που κινούνται στο φλοιό τη γη ξεκίνησε τη δεκαετία του 60. Το μεγάλο ερώτημα τη δεκαετία του 70 είναι γιατί η τεκτονική των πλακών δεν λειτουργούσε καλά στις Υπήρους. Δεν μπορούσε να εξηγήσει τις δομές και τα τοπία που ενδιέφεραν τους γεωλόγους και γι' αυτό ένα πράγμα που αρέσει να λέει του, του James είναι ότι οι γεωλόγοι δεν θα είχαν ποτέ ανακαλύψει από μόνοι τους τη τεκτονική των πλακών. Η τεκτονική λοιπόν των πλακών είναι μία ακριβής περιγραφή της, των κινήσεων των ωκεάνιων λεκανών αλλά όχι των Υπήρων. Τι συμβαίνει στους Υπήρους. Ο James Jackson ήταν από τους πρώτους που χρησιμοποίησε σεισμογραφήματα για να ερμηνεύσει τα ρήγματα που προξενούσαν τους σεισμούς. Με τη ραγδαία εξέλιξη των υπολογιστικών μεθόδων μπορούσε κανείς να βρει τον ακριβή προσανατολισμό των ρηγμάτων. 
πριν από αρχίσει να γίνεται αυτό το πράγμα, δεν μπορούσε κανείς να βρει ποια κατεύθυνση είχε το, 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 το ρήγμα, το μέγεθός του, την κατεύθυνση στην οποία κινείται και πόσο βαθύ είναι. Αυτό ξεκινάει εκείνη την εποχή ακριβώς και ένας τους ανθρώπους το οποίο του ξεκίνησε ήταν ο κ. Τζάκσον. Τα νέα λοιπόν διαγνωστικά μέσα είχαν ακρίβεια που ξαφνικά έκανε τη σεισμολογία χρήσιμη στη δομική γεωλογία. Δηλαδή, ήταν σαν να έχετε έναν καρδιολόγο και τα καρδιογραφήματα πλέον να μπορεί κανείς να τα συνδέσει με το τι γίνεται structurally στην καρδιά. Και όπως άλλους επιστημονικούς κλάδους, οι μεγάλες αλλαγές στις επιστήμες συνδεθήκανε με τεχνολογική πρόοδο. Ο κ. Τζάκσον επέφερε μεγάλη αλλαγή προσθέτοντας τις αναλύσεις μετρήσεις του GPS. Τώρα πλέον μπορούμε να βρούμε με ανάλυση ενός μιλιμέτρ ανά σε όλο τον πλανήτη τι κινείται και τι δεν κινείται καθόλου. Ο κ. Τζάκσον συνέδεσε όλες αυτές τις τεχνολογικές εξελίξεις με πραγματικές έρευνες πεδίου, ώστε να συγκρίνει αυτά που μετρούσε με αυτό που βλέπουμε στο έδαφος. Αυτό το καταλαβαίνω απόλυτα, γιατί είναι το αντίστοιχο αυτό που είχα κάνει με τους μαθητές μου για να συγκρίνουμε τις μελέτες των υπολογιστικών μοντέλων για τσουνάμι τις μετρή, με μετρήσεις τις οποίες παίρναμε στο πεδίο. Οι μετακινήσεις στα ρήγματα και στους σεισμούς είναι στην πραγματικότητα αρκετά μικρές. Η μεγαλύτερη που θα δείτε ποτέ είναι μερικά μέτρα. Και, αλλά οι επαναλαμβανόμενοι σεισμοί στο ίδιο σημείο δημιουργούν το τοπίο. Οπότε, μπορεί να καταλ... αν καταλάβετε τι σημαίνει σε έναν δεδομένο σεισμό, μπορείτε να καταλάβετε τι θα γίνει άμα έχει κανείς χίλιους σεισμούς στο ίδιο μέρος. Όλη αυτή η ανάλυση που σας λέω είναι η ανάλυση του κ. Τζάξον. Σε όλη την επιστημονική του καριέρα, ο καθηγητής Τζάξον προσπαθεί να καταλάβει γιατί οι Ήπειροι διαφέρουν από τους ωκεανούς. Ένα από τα αγαπημένα του παραδείγματα είναι η Ινδία. Η Ινδία συγκρούστηκε με την Ασία και έτσι η Ασία τσαλακώθηκε από τα Ιμαλάια μέχρι τη Μογγολία. Ενώ η Ινδία είναι σε ένα μεγάλο βαθμό ανέπαφη. Η εξήγηση του Τζέιμ Τζάξον είναι ότι η Ασία και η Ινδία δεν είναι το ίδιο γεωλογικά. Η Ινδία είναι επίπεδη σαν τη Γανίτα. Και όλα τα special effects συμβαίνουν περίπου 3.000 χιλιόμετρα βόρεια. Σκέφτηκε λοιπόν ότι αυτό οφείλεται στο ότι υπάρχει διαφορά των υλικών στην αντοχή των πετρωμάτων. Υπάρχουν διαφορέ στην αντοχή των πετρωμάτων και ότι οι σεισμοί που γίνονται είναι υποκατάστατο για να καταλάβει κανεί τι συμβαίνει. Αυτή είναι η μεγάλη προσφορά του κ. Τζάξον. Αυτό τώρα σα φαίνεται κάτι τελείω προφανέ. Αλλά σα διαβεβαιώ, την εποχή που γινόταν δεν ήταν καθόλου προφανέ. Θα τελειώσω με μερικά λόγια για την κοινωνική προσφορά του κ. Τζάξον στον μετριασμό τη επικίνδυνοτητα. Η κοινοπραξία φυσικών και κοινωνικών επιστημόνων και κοινωνιολόγων με την επωνυμία Σεισμοί Χωρί Σύνορα, Earthquakes Without Frontiers, που ηγήθηκε ο κ. Τζάξον, προσπάθησε να κατανοήσει τι ευπάθειε των κοινωνίτων που κινδυνεύουν και να κοινοποιήσει αυτή τη νέα γνώση στους υπευθύνους χάραξης πολιτικής. Το κίνητρο της κοινοπραξίας ήταν η διαπίστωση ότι τα τελευταία 120 χρόνια είχαμε περίπου 130 σεισμούς, ε, καθένας, 130 σεισμούς που είχαν πάνω από χίλιους νεκρούς ο καθένας. Περίπου 100 από αυτούς τους σεισμούς στο, συνέβησαν στο εσωτερικό των Υπήρων, προκαλώντας τουλάχιστον 1.400.000 θανάτους. Οι, συμβί, οι, οι σεισμοί συμβαίνουν όταν τα ρήγματα μετακινούνται. Αλλά τα ρήγματα στο εσωτερικό των υπηρετικών περιοχών είναι διασκορπισμένα σε χιλιάδες χιλιόμετρα, ενώ των ωκεανίων πλακών ουσιαστικά περιορίζονται σε στενές ζώνες, όπως ο δακτύλιος της φωτιάς γύρω από τον Ιρνικό. Αυτός ο εντοπισμός της δραστηριότητα σημαίνει ότι οι, συμβοί, οι σεισμοί επαναλαμβάνονται στο ίδιο σημείο, στα όρια των ωκεάνιων πλατκών, πιο συχνά από ότι στο εσωτερικό των Υπήρων. Στο εσωτερικό λοιπόν των Υπήρων, οι σεισμοί στο ίδιο ρήγμα μπορεί να επαναλαμβάνονται μόνο κάθε χιλιάδες χρόνια και όχι κάθε μερικούς αιώνες, όπως στα, στα όρια των ωκεανίων πλακών. Δέκα, μερικές χιλιάδες χρόνια είναι πολύ μεγάλο διάστημα για την ανθρώπινη μνήμη ή την καταγεγραμμένη ιστορία. Ως αποτέλεσμα, οι κοινότητες που ζουν στο εσωτερικό των υπηρετικών περιοχών συχνά αγνοούν τα ρήγματα που βρίσκονται κάτω από αυτές και το σεισμικό κίνδυνο. Οι απρόσμενοι σεισμοί στο ΠΑΜ του Ιράν το 2003 
και στο Μουζαφεραμπάντ στο Πακιστάν το 2005 και στο Γουέντσουάν της Κίνας το 2008, για παράδειγμα, συνολικά σκότωσαν 175.000 ανθρώπους που αντιστοιχούσε στο 30% του πληθυσμού. Για σύγκριση, οι σεισμοί στη Νέα Ζηλανδία το 2011 του Christchurch και ο σεισμός της Ιαπωνίας το 2011 σκοτώσαν αντίστοιχα το 0,1 με 0,4 του πληθυσμού. Αυτή τη μεγάλη διαφορά μεταξύ ανεπτυγμένων και υποανάπτυξη χωρών προσπαθεί να με κάνει στην κοινωνική του προσφορά ο κ. Τζάκσον. Ο κ. Τζάκσον είχε μια επιπλέον εξήγηση για αυτή τη μεγάλη διαφορά για τη σοβαρότητα δηλαδή των επιπτώσεων στις υπηρετικές χώρες, περιοχές. Είναι η θέση των πόλεων. Ιδίω σε άνυρα κλίματα, όπως στην Κεντρική Ασία, που η θέση των πόλεων καθορίζεται σχεδόν αποκλειστικά από την διαθεσιμότητα υπογείων υδάτων, η οποία όμως δυστυχώς σχετίζεται με τα ρήγματα. Ο κ. Τζάκσεν είναι ο πρώτος που κατάλαβε αυτήν την πολύ τραγική σχέση. Οι άνθρωποι πηγαίνουν και ζουν εκεί που υπάρχει νερό και δυστυχώς είναι οι πιο επικίνδυνες περιοχές για αυτούς. Οι μεγάλοι λοιπόν αστικοί πληθυσμοί είναι συγκεντρωμένοι σε ευάλωτα σημεία και γι' αυτό πολύ πρόσφατοι σεισμοί μοιάζουν σαν να έχουν εστιαστεί αποκλειστικά στις πιο τροτές πόλεις. Ένα μεγάλο επίτευγμα του καθηγητή Τζάκσον επιτεύχθηκε όταν έγινε ο σεισμός του Καντμαντού το 2000, στο Νεπάλ, κοντά στο Καντμαντού το 2015. Τότε προειδοποίησε τις τοπικές αρχές και τους κατοίκους ότι ο σεισμός που μόλις είχε συμβεί είχε μόνο εν μέρη τελειώσει το έργο του και ότι το μισό ρήγμα θα μπορούσε να διαραγεί οποιανδήποτε στιγμή. Οι τοπικές αρχές του Νεπάλ ευτυχώς άκουσαν τη συμβουλή και προετοιμάζονται ήδη για το μεγάλο κτύπημα. Το έργο του κ. Τζάκσον και των συνεργατών του δεν ήταν καθόλου εύκολο. Δεν είναι εύκολο να πει σε μια περιοχή που μόλις έχουν πεθάνει 9.000 άνθρωποι ότι ενδέχεται να γίνει ένας εξίσου μεγάλος ή μεγαλύτερος σεισμός και δεν ξέρουμε καθόλου πότε θα είναι. Κατά τη γνώμη μου, το έργο της κοινοπραξίας στο Νεπάλ μείωσε τον αριθμό των νεκρών που θα μπορούσε να ήταν ακόμα και 100.000. Για όλες αυτές τις προσφορές, αγαπητέ James, η Ακαδημία Αθηνών σε καλωσορίζει στους κόλπους μας. Να συνεχίσετε να προσφέρετε στην επιστήμη και στον κόσμο. Ευχαριστώ τον συνάδελφο κύριε Συνολάκη για την διαγράφηση της έρευνας και της σταδιοδρομίας του τιμόμενου απόψε καθηγητή κ. Τζάκσον. Βέβαια, ε, είδαμε ότι ο κ. Σινουλάκης χρησιμοποίησε πάρα πολλές φωτογραφίες από την Κρήτη που ορισμένοι εξημών υποψηφιστήκαμε ότι είναι Κρήτης ορμόμενος. Ευχαριστώ πολύ κ. Σινουλάκη. Και τώρα είναι η στιγμή που θα γίνει η απονομή ε, του διπλώματος αντεπιστέλλοντος μέλους του Ιδρύματος. Uh, uh, our dear colleague, Professor Jackson, uh, now we will uh, give you the diploma of recognition as a member of uh, the Academy of Athens. Uh, please stand.
Tom? Thank you. Mr. President, Vice Presidents, um, Academicians, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and old friends. It is a great honour to be here today and I thank Professor Sinarakis very much for what he said, although I didn't understand it. Um, Greece has been very central to my scientific career and my, uh, my life generally. Uh, it was the site of my first geological field trip ever in 1975 when I was just a 20-year-old undergraduate and I've been in, in captivated by it ever since. I've spent a large amount of my career here and it's easy for me to focus on Greece in this talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to do so. Many of my happiest and most um, rewarding scientific experiences have been here. But there's another reason for doing this as well. And the message of my talk today is to try and explain why it is that Greece has been so important to me and my colleagues uh, over the last few decades and in the development of our subject. Um, Greece is not a big country, but it has been disproportionately influential in the world in understanding the whole subject which I'm going to be talking about. And that is the message I want to get across. This will not be a technical talk. The only bit of science you need to understand is to know what an earthquake is. Earthquakes happen when rocks break and slide past each other. They do that on surfaces which we call faults. Now here's an example. This is a picture outside Los Angeles in California. And what you're seeing is a river which flows from the background and it stops at that line across the picture and then it continues. And the river has been moved sideways eight meters. And that happened in an earthquake in 1857 in California. And that surface is called a fault. And in this case, it was about 200 kilometers long. It was about 15 kilometers into the earth. Uh, and when the rocks move past each other, they vibrate. And the vibrations are what causes the trouble in earthquakes. I'm not going to be talking about that aspect this time. I'm going to be talking about how this creates the world we live in. Faults can move sideways, like that one. They can also move vertically. This is an example from New Zealand. So the movements may be up and down and sideways. Now, if we look at the map of the world, here's a map of earthquakes in the world, the red dots are the earthquakes. Every red dot is a fault moving, like the ones I showed. So this is a map of where things are happening. And most parts of the world, nothing is happening. It's blue in the oceans, and nothing is happening. If you see a dot map like that, your instinct is to join the dots. We join the dots and those yellow lines are the boundaries of the tectonic plates, which are like spherical caps, which move around on the surface of the Earth. And this is all you need to do to understand what happens in the oceans. It's very simple. The plates move like conveyor belts. In this cartoon here, you can see what happens. The plates separate in the middle of the oceans at ridges. They move apart like that. And where they move together on the edges of continents, the ocean will slide underneath the continent. Think of when you go on the metro. You go on the moving staircase, it comes to the top, and it just slides back into the earth. This is what happens here, right? And that is all you need to know to understand how the oceans work. If you look at the continents, it's not so simple. Let's look at this region here of the continents, and you can see it's quite a different pattern. The earthquakes are spread over a very wide distance. You cannot possibly join the dots together to identify a boundary. It doesn't work. If we concentrate here, we can see what's happening is that Africa and Arabia and India are moving north towards Asia, but they are like passengers on the conveyor belt at the metro. If you are standing on the conveyor belt, you come to the top, you do not slide into the earth. You get pushed off and you collide with someone else on top. That is what's happening here. And so this is quite a different pattern. If we look at Greece, here's Greece, and we look at the earthquakes in Greece, there are earthquakes everywhere, 600 kilometers east, west, and north, south. And here's Athens. It makes no sense to ask what plate is Athens on. It is not on a plate. It is in the middle of a smashed up zone of many, many faults over many hundreds of kilometers. It is a completely different language. And so for the last 50 years, last 55 decades, it's been a detective problem. The problem is what language do we use to talk about this? It is different language from the oceans. 
So how do we put this language together? And this is where Greece has been so influential in helping us to develop that language. Now, in the interest of giving a, a narrative, a story, I'm not going to stop every two minutes and say this came from this person, and this person, this person. But I do want to say, I will come back to, uh, later, to saying there are people in the audience here I am particularly grateful to for their information, their work, which has very strongly influenced what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is, is a result of, of the work of a lot of people, and I will come back to that at the end. Let's start by what's happening in this part of the world. The black lines here are some major faults in this part of the world, and what's happening is that Arabia is moving north. Now, Arabia is moving north, but Turkey is moving to the west, and Greece is moving to the southwest. So as Arabia is moving north into Asia, Turkey and Greece are moving out of the way, sideways. And how does that work? It works because of these, this is all continental material, but in the Mediterranean Sea, it is oceanic material. So the ocean material, just like the top of the metro, can slide into the earth and you can push Greece over the top. So that is what's happening. That is what allows this process to happen. And the two big faults which make this Tur movement of Turkey happen in the north, the North Anatolian Fault, in the southeast, southeast Anatolian Fault, these have moved in very large earthquakes over time. The most recent ones you'll be familiar with, in 1999, there was a big earthquake east of Istanbul, and this is what it did. There's a picture showing a road, which was once straight, and you can see there's the fault, and the background has moved to the right, about five meters. And the earthquake a year ago in southeast Turkey in 2023, that was moving in the other direction. Here is a road which was straight, and it's moved the other way, to the left, by about five meters. And those two types of movement allow Turkey to move to the west. Now this pattern that we've known for some time, this is a map that you can't see the date, but those are the purple circles are historical earthquakes from between 800 and 1900 AD. So before the modern instrumental area of seismology, and they show exactly the same pattern. And this map of the earthquakes was put together by an academician here, Nicholas Ambraces, who a lot of you will know, who was really responsible for this whole subject. He invented this subject of historical seismicity, at least he invented the level of scholarship and the standards which we need to do it uh, in, a, in a modern way. He was a very great scientist, and what that shows is exactly the white lines, the major faults which move uh, these places around. These are the bigger earthquakes of that thousand year period. And so, the, the, the top one moved in a series of great earthquakes from east to west in 1939, 42, 43, 44, 57, 67, 99 was the last one. So like a tearing a piece of paper right across the northern part of Turkey. And that is complete contrast to the central part of Turkey, Anatolia, where almost nothing has happened for a thousand years. The earthquakes are concentrated in those two zones. Now, if we now can measure this directly with GPS, so GPS will tell us the motion very, very accurately of any points on the ground, and here they are, and those arrows show that Turkey and Greece are moving to the west and the southwest about 30 millimeters a year, about the, rate, the speed your fingernails will grow. And we can measure that exactly. So we can see this motion now extremely easily. And to summarize it, this is what it looks like then. Now, why is that so important? This was, a, this was the first insight into how continents work, and it came from here. Why was it so important? In the oceans, if you have two plates which move together, there's plate A, plate B, plate B is moving north, there is the boundary. The boundary is a single fault. There's no choice. What happens on that fault is exactly the same as the movements between the plates. They converge. There's no choice. On the continents, it's different. Because we have a wide deforming zone of many earthquakes over hundreds of kilometers, you have choices. You could do different things. You might do a simple convergence. You might move things together. You make taller mountains. That is what happens in the Caucasus, eastern Europe, northeast Turkey, northwest Iran. That is the process which is happening. But you have a choice. You may also push material to the side, out of the way. And that is what is happening in Turkey and in Greece. So this understanding was really important. It shows that what is happening in southwest Greece, in the Peloponnese and, Tur and Crete and so on, is directly influenced by what is happening in Iran. Right? 
2,000 kilometers away, it, you, it is a very three-dimensional problem. It is not like the oceans at all. So this was a, it's a really important insight. It was made in 1970 by my colleague Dan McKenzie at Cambridge, and it was the first insight into how the continents are different. And it came from here, and it was immediately influential everywhere else. So people immediately started looking at Asia, and we had diagrams like this. Oh, India is colliding with Asia. Maybe China can be pushed to the side, right? But this kind of cartoon came from looking at Greece first. Right? And so that's a first example of, of how significant this place was. Well, okay, let's go back and look at it a bit more closely. So what it tells, shows you is that the motion of Turkey to the west must continue through central Greece. It has to go through this area of the red circle somehow. Otherwise, it would stop. It has, no, it has to reach the trench system, what I'm calling the Hellenic Trench, which is the top of the metro moving staircase, right? It has, it has to reach there. The question is, how does it cross Greece? Well, if we look at the earthquakes in Greece, it's obvious it's not a single fault. There are earthquakes everywhere, so there are faults everywhere. It's not a single line crossing central Greece. What's happening is there are lots of earthquakes in, in different areas. And this difference in, in behavior is very uh, evident if we look at the smaller earthquakes now of the last thousand years. Again, in Anatolia, there's nothing, almost nothing happens in the central part of Turkey. But as soon as you get to Western Turkey and Greece and the Aegean, there are many, many earthquakes over a wide region. And again, this was an insight we got from Nick Ambrose's work. So what do we do? What can we do? The first thing you notice is, yes, that fault from Turkey, the famous North Anatolian fault, which comes through Istanbul, you can identify it as far as the Sporides Islands, Mount Pelion. It can go that far, you see. But the question is, what happens here? It has to somehow cross central Greece to reach the Hellenic Trench in the Ionian Islands. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. It has to do it. How does it do it? It obviously does not do it with just a single line. So we have to know how that connection works. So that means we have to look at what is happening in central Greece. Okay, so what is happening in central Greece? Every red circle there is a fault moving in an earthquake somehow. What do these faults look like? There are so many, we can look at them easily. This is an example. In this region we're looking now, this is the fault from 1981. There were earthquakes in, in the eastern part of the Gulf of Corinth, by Corinth and Perakora. This is a picture in 1981 showing what happened. That was the movement. The red arrow shows the movement of about two meters, one to two meters on this fault. But it's more interesting than that. If you look at the picture on the right, the white line shows the ground level before the earthquake. You can see further up that slope, there's lots of vegetation growing on the surface, not on the lower part, which was exposed in 1981. And this tells you straight away that that surface on the right, the polished surface, is the result of many earthquakes. Several earthquakes have created that surface, not just one. And if you can see the same thing further on, this is further north by um, Kaminovola. And you can see, again, this great polished surface here. And there are people standing at the bottom. Give you some idea of the size. That's 50 meters. And a single earthquake will move one or two meters. We're looking at 50 earthquakes repeating on that again and again and again. And that picture is taken at the base of this mountain on the left. So, and on the right, it's the same fault. You can see at the bottom there, a person for scale. Um, that big polished surface is at the bottom of the slope on the left. And so without much imagination, you can understand that mountain is produced by the left-hand side falling down into the sea. That is what produces that landscape. Re are many, many earthquakes o over a long period. And if we look at central Greece, you see the mountains all look like this. This is Skinos, which is on the Perakola Peninsula to the west of Athens. Here's the, looking at Parnassos from the north side here. Those very steep slopes in central Greece, they all have faults along the bottom, which move in earthquakes, and that is how the landscape is created. So those very steep uh, mountain fronts are made by repeated earthquakes again and again and again. So the landscape of Greece is created by earthquakes. That's what that picture is telling us. So, okay, what else can we do? This is a map of that central part of Greece. The black lines are all these faults, and they go roughly east-west. They don't go in the direction we expected, which was this shearing motion to come through central Greece in that direction. So the faults are doing something strange. How does this work? 
Well, so the next development was this. If you have faults which move like that, as you can see, the two sides get further apart. If you slide down a slope, you get further apart like that. The place is stretching, it's extending. So it's telling us that this part of central Greece, sorry, is, is actually, sorry, this part of central Greece is stretching in a north-south direction by this kind of motion on these faults. So what are the importance of that? If we come back and look at the bigger picture here, those east-west faults are in central Greece, in western Turkey, and in the Aegean Sea. It's telling us that the whole of that area, as it's moving towards the southwest in the Aegean Sea, it's also stretching in that direction. It's extending. That is why the Aegean Sea is underwater. Because what's happening, this is Archimedes' principle, if you stretch the continental crust, it becomes thinner. You stretch anything, it becomes thinner. And because it's thinner, it will sink. Just like wood floating on water, as in this example here, we all know this from icebergs. If you have a big iceberg, it is higher out of the water than a thin iceberg. And so when you stretch the Aegean Sea, it sinks below the water. So the reason the Aegean between Greece and Turkey is underwater is because it's thinner. A very simple insight. Now that insight is, is simply shown in this cartoon. You have the crust, you stretch it, it becomes thinner, with this faulting, it sinks, it may sink below sea level, it may fill with water, it may fill with sediments, you may get what we call a sediment basin, a sedimentary basin, and it may eventually break and become an ocean and you have two halves of the sedimentary basin like that. Why is this so important? This insight is so important because it tells you, it came from again my same colleague 1978, 1978 Dan McKenzie, this simple insight has controlled oil exploration around the continents since 1978, since 1980. This has had implications for trillions of dollars of the world economy. This is the most enormous insight into how things work. Why was it so important? Because there's only one thing which matters, which is how much you stretch it. And that single number will tell you, firstly, how much you thin the crust, secondly, how much it sinks, and thirdly, because the hot material underneath becomes closer to the surface, it heats it up. So it tells you the entire temperature evolution of the sediments which fill that basin. And therefore, if there's any um, organic material, how it heats up to become oil and gas and so on. So it's an enormously powerful insight. And of course, it has controlled oil exploration on the continental margins and continental basins now for nearly 40 years. And of course, everyone thinks, oh, it came from the oil exploration world. No, it didn't. It came from looking at earthquakes in Greece. There's no substantial oil to talk of in Greece, but the insight from Greece is where this came from. Now, the first test of it did indeed come from the North Sea between your uh, UK and Norway. And that was an oil province which was being developed at this time. And the blow up shows in the brown area between those, uh, the area where the oil is. And the place has stretched. It stretched in that direction by the same kind of faulting as in Greece. And here's a map showing on the left the UK here, on the right is Norway. And the colors show the thickness of the sediment. So the sediment is about three kilometers thick in the middle. And the middle, the black lines are where the faults are. That's where the, the oil developed. And so to test this hypothesis of how it formed, um, my colleagues in Cambridge did a seismic line, which is how you measure the thickness of the crust along that red line there. And what they found, shown in this cartoon, is that underneath the UK and underneath Norway, the thickness of the continental crust is about 30 kilometers. But in the middle of the North Sea, it's only about 22. And from that, you can tell the amount of extension. You can also tell the amount of extension from the amount of subsidence. The fact there's three kilometers of sediment also tells you the amount of extension independently. And those two numbers are, give you the same answer, which is about 100 kilometers of extension between Norway and the UK in the last 200 million years. So that was the number we came up with. But then the oil companies said, wait a minute, in the middle we have these faults and the faults move like this. You should be able to add up the motion across the faults and get the amount of extension that way. So they did it, and the answer they got was 10 kilometers. <laughs> so the academics were getting 100 kilometers, the oil company was getting 10 kilometers, and this was a difference of the factor of 10. You cannot say, oh, it's the same within errors. It's obviously one or both are wrong. 
right? And so this was immediately a huge uh, debate and uh, argument in the 1980s. And the question was, did the oil companies really understand faults? So let's go back to Greece. This argument was resolved in Greece. Greece has plenty of these faults. Here they are, lots of them, beautiful faults. You can see them. They are not underneath three kilometers of sediment. These you can touch, right? There's no argument about what they look like. And you can see them at the surface. We can use seismology to tell their shape underground. We know a lot about these faults. And it's more interesting than that. Because Greece is at sea level, when the faults move, you can see if the land is moving up or down. Here are some places where the land is clearly moving up relative to the sea. You can see this is like a, a bathtub ring where the land has been lifted out of the water. And where it's been lifted out of the water, you can see marine creatures, corals, shells, and so on which allow you to date it, and you can see how fast it is coming out of the water. But in the same general area, you see pictures like this. These are archaeological sites which are underwater. And the left famous Cancreania uh, uh, in Corinthos, and on the right is at Skinos, another archaeological site now underwater. This is a church which sunk two metres in 1981 in an earthquake. So clearly, the sea level is not changing. The sea cannot go up and down in the same place. It is the land moving, not the sea, because we have a reference level. Well, you can see this in Greece easily because it's at sea level. Well, hooray, what, what, let's use this. So what can we see? So this is a, a picture looking along the east of Gulf of Corinth from the eastern side towards Corinth. And this white line is the fault system which moved in the earthquakes in 1981. And these earthquakes were enormously influential because the fault crosses the coastline and on the left, everywhere on the left of that, the, the land is moving up, and everywhere on the right of it, the land is moving down. It's an extremely simple pattern, um, completely obvious at that time. And if we go now to move to central Greece, this is the region of the Gulf of Evia. We're looking up the Spekios Valley towards Lamia. This is the ancient region of Locris. The three major mountain ranges are Panassos, Kalidromon, and Krimis here. Each one is a very steep mountain front, bounded by faults, the white lines there, on the steep side. And they are moving just like the ones in the Gulf of Corinth. So on the left-hand side, it's going up. On the right-hand side, it's going down. And if you have a region between two faults, one side's up, the other side's down, they are rotating. Really simple, just like that. And you can see it in the landscape of Greece. I'll show you a picture looking along this valley between Knimis and, and Kalidromon. This is what the valley looks like. All the fields are tilted. It is really hard being a farmer in these fields because nothing is flat. Everything is tilted like this. We know these, these are geological strata. We know they were horizontal because they are lake beds. They are full of shells. They were originally lakes and lakes are horizontal, but now they have tilted like that. And so that it was immediately clear how these faults work. They work like this. If you have a cross section with parallel faults, they move and as they move, they rotate. They, they stretch, they rotate. And as they rotate between them, you have valleys, basins, which fill with sediments and it rotates some more, then it rotates some more. And it's exactly like books falling over on a bookshelf. Right? And books which are inclined take up more space than books which are upright. We do not have to worry about the gaps at the bottom of the books because in pink here, the colour, is where the lower crust is hot and it will flow. It will flow like honey. And so it, we, we don't have to worry about that particular problem. And this really, really simple insight, it says the amount you stretch depends only on how steep the faults are, the inclination of the faults, and how much you rotate them. That's the only thing. Very straightforward. And this simple understanding completely resolved that problem in the North Sea. The oil companies were wrong. They knew nothing about this. They had no idea how these faults worked. And the academics were a little bit wrong. The true answer is not 100 kilometers, not 10, it's about 85, right? So we were not completely wrong either. But this simple insight, which came from Greece, changed the world of, of the oil exploration. Because unlike in academic world, people will carry on believing in their hypothesis, even if it is obviously wrong, it carries on for several years. The entire oil industry changed overnight. The stakes are billions of dollars. You cannot hang on to an idea which is obviously wrong, right? So it just changed. So this had enormous impact, but again, it came from here. It didn't come from anywhere else. This was the place you could see these faults. I still haven't answered the question of what's happening. How does this do it? How does this motion, motion actually come through Greece? Well, let's have a look at those faults a bit more closely. There's another thing we can do. If you look at these faults 
here, these are ones in the Gulf of Corinth, it is obvious which direction they are moving. You can see the striations on the faults. This is like scratching down the surface. It, you don't have to be very clever. That is the direction they are moving. And you can measure it. So let's see what the directions look like. Now here are two pictures. On the left are the GPS measurements showing the actual direction of movement of the points on the ground. And not surprisingly, everything is moving to the southwest. We know that has to be true. Okay, that's not a surprise. Now on the right are the directions of motion on these faults. And you can measure them at the surface, but you can also measure them with seismology, um, which is also helpful. And if we zoom in and look at that part in the middle, you can see the arrows are pointing north-south. The faults are moving in the wrong direction. How can they achieve the job on the left by moving in the wrong direction? That on the left, it's absolutely clear Greece is moving to the southwest. Everything in central Greece is moving to the southwest, but the faults, the material is moving to the south. And the only way you can reconcile this is at the same time if the faults are rotating clockwise. Then it'll be okay. Then a movement to the south with a clockwise rotation will do the job. And the first test of whether this was the right direction to be going in, the right idea, was to look at what's called the magnetism in rocks. So when sediments are deposited, sediments contain small grains of iron oxide, which is magnetic. Like, think of little magnets in the, in the soil, in the, in, in the sediments, and in the, these little magnets will align themselves in the Earth's magnetic field. And then they get frozen into the rock. So when the rock is formed, it's full of little magnets pointing north. Now, if the rocks are then rotated, the magnets are going to point in a different direction, and we can measure that. So this, is a, 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 this was first done by our colleagues uh, Catherine Kissel and Carlo Large from France in 1988, and they were looking at these places where you see there's obviously data. And those directions are not pointing north. They're pointing east of north, about 30 degrees. And this is very early information. It's now much better. But that showed already in 1988 that this clockwise rotation is something to do with it. This is how it works in central Greece. OK, let's look a bit more closely. How is that manifest? If this area is also rotating at the same time as it's moving in faults, how does that work? What, is, what can you see in the landscape which tells you this is happening? And the secret was extraordinary. We can, I show you the results from the GPS, which is very clear. If you look at the Gulf of Corinth, which is opening in the north-south direction, it's opening much faster in the west. So in the west, by Egeon and Orion, Antirion, that area, it's about 12 millimeters a year across the Gulf of Corinth. In the middle, by Zalikastron, that sort of area, it's about eight. By Perakora, it's about five. And when you get here, west of Athens, it's zero. So the Gulf of Corinth is not opening like a parallel side. It's opening, as you're seeing it, like that. It's like a triangular opening. It's opening in that way. Opening more, faster in, in the west than in the east. If we go to the next system to the north, the Gulf of Evia, we see the opposite. In the Gulf of Evia, it's much slower. It's opening about two millimeters a year in the region of Agios Constantinos, that sort of area, Martinon. And as we go west up the Sperkios Valley, again, it drives away to zero. And if I show you a view, this is that it's opening the other way. So the Gulf of Evia is opening that way, faster in the, in the east than the west. So the opposite of the Gulf of Corinth. The Gulf of Corinth is doing that underneath, and, and Evia is doing that in the north. OK. And if you look at the, we could tell this before the GPS, and this was the triumph, again, of some of my colleagues working in Greece. If you look at the coastline of the south, south side of the Gulf of Corinth, you can see lots of horizontal lines. And those horizontal levels are the old level of the sea. And the rocks have been lifted out of the sea. And because we know the age of those levels, we can see how fast this is being lifted out of the sea. And it's being lifted out of the sea in the west much faster than the east. And that tells us the faults are moving faster in the west than the east. So we knew this before the GPS measurements confirmed it in the Gulf of Corinth. In the Gulf of Evia, you can see the same thing. We're looking up the Sperkios Valley here from Agios Constantinos past Lamia to Kapanisi, and it is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. It gets smaller and smaller in that direction, and it's clearly opening the other way. So how does that help? We can really demonstrate this with GPS. This shows GPS measurements for that pink region in the central part of Greece between Corinth and Evia. Those points are hardly moving relative to each other. We can use them as a reference. And look at the arrows in the Peloponnese. The Peloponnese is clearly rotating anti-clockwise relative to that. And if we look at the, to the north, 
the whole region of, of, of Evia and uh, Thessaly are rotating the other direction. So these rotations are very clear also from the GPS. Why is that important? It's saying what's happening, and this is a cartoon, is that the fault from Turkey is coming towards Evia, Mount Pedi, and it just stops. And it turns into the, the Gulf of Evia, which dies away to the west. And to the south, we have the Gulf of Corinth, which dies to the east. And I can show you, here's a piece of paper. We could make, cut a piece of paper like this, and I'm going to move the bottom towards the southwest, which is Peloponnese, moving to the southwest, and you can see how it opens. It opens like that. I've said this is a better cartoon here. It's moving to the southwest, it will open like that. And you can see how the region between the Gulf of Evia in the north and the Gulf of Corinth underneath just rotates clockwise. And that is what solves this whole problem. It is why the faults can move in a north-south direction, but because it's all rotating clockwise, that will give you overall a southwest movement. So this is how it works. Now this, once we understood this, this was of enormous significance because many of the continents in Asia and in North America have these big, big faults where the movement is sideways and then it stops. How can you stop? What do you do? How do you stop these things? And the answer is they turn into a different sort of fault which dies away to the side. So everyone, all geologists used to think all basins move like parallel sides. No, they don't. They move like this or like that. Right? And that is the secret to understanding how these rotations work. So as soon as this was understood from Greece, suddenly people said, oh, I've got the same thing in China, in Mongolia, in Iran, in Nevada, in California. You could, this understanding again was exported from Greece because it's so clear what is happening here. And so what have we done? To come back to this picture, we had to develop a language of how to look at this kind of place. Uh, and if you look in detail like this, you see lots of earthquakes, which means lots of faults. You need to look at that detail. How do the faults move? And so this is like looking at a painting. Here we are looking at a painting closely, and all you see are the pieces of paint. You see the detail of the pieces of paint on the painting. If you want to see what is the result of all that activity, all that detail, you stand back and you can see what the painting is. Whoops. Yeah. Ah. So much for my surprise. The, the, on the right is, 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 is the overall picture. On the right is the equivalent of looking at GPS. You see the result. On the left is the equivalent of looking at all the faults in central Greece to ask how do the faults achieve this result. And you need both. And this is now the language we re routinely use to look at the continents and describe what is happening and wonder what, why it is happening. And this is the language of the two scales, if you like, that you need to use. And if you stand back and say, okay, this is the GPS showing what's going on, it's quite clear why it's going on. In the east, we have the highest mountains in Western Asia, the Caucasus, eastern Iran, oh, northwest Iran and eastern Turkey. In the Hellenic Trench, south of west of Crete, is the deepest part of the Mediterranean. It's three and a half kilometers deep. And not surprisingly, the material is flowing downhill. Right? That is what gravity does. It moves from material from high ground to low ground here. But as it's doing it, it's broken up by all the faulting. And this is rather like looking at a river with a river with blocks of floating ice. And the river is going to take all the ice downstream. We know that. The river is going to flow in a particular direction. But the blocks can interact with each other. They can rotate, they can push sideways, they can ride on top of each other. And what they choose to do is something you can only discover by looking at the earthquakes in detail. Uh, and from there, there are many other questions you can use. But I wanted to show how, how Greece was so important in, in that. So here's what you can do with that general picture. This is a map of Greece as it looks now. We can say, okay, if we know what's happening now, what would it look like in five million years' time? Oh, it would look like this. So it's, you can see it's got longer in the north-south direction. You can see it's rotating clockwise. So look at the island of Evia here, which is rotated. The, the coastline would not look the same. Right? because motions are up and down, but just to show you the general idea. Or we can go back in time. We can say, here's what it looks like now. What did it look like five million years ago? It would have this shape. So Greece was much more continuous with Turkey, and actually the north, the Aegean Sea would be land. But you can see how we can use this to understand how, how the place changes. So I, this talk was called How Earthquakes Shape Greece. But in reality, what I've done is tell you how Greece has shaped our understanding of the world. Right? Because that is why I and my colleagues have spent so much time looking at Greece, because many of these central ideas came from here. And why then is Greece so special? 
Well, firstly, it's so special because it's so fast. So this picture here shows Greece, and the Aegean Sea is stretching about 30 millimeters a year. And it's 600 kilometers across. Well, in the Western United States, in Nevada and Utah, you have the same process. It's only 10 millimeters a year, over 1,000 kilometers, right? In Tibet, it's the same process. It's 20 millimeters a year, over 2,000 kilometers. And here's the Gulf of Corinth. These maps are all drawn at the same scale. And here's the Gulf of Corinth. The Gulf of Corinth is only 10 kilometers wide, but the rate of extension is the same as across the whole of Nevada and Utah from the Rocky Mountains to California, Sierra Nevada. Right? So it's so much faster in Greece that all these processes happen more quickly. There are many more earthquakes. You can see what's going on in great detail. So the speed was really important. And because of that, uh, and also because it's at sea level, you can see the vertical motions, which really tell you what is happening. And there's no chance of doing that in Tibet or Nevada or East Africa or anywhere else. You have no reference level, you have no base level, you have no idea what's really going up and what's really going down. In Greece, it's obvious because it's at sea level. And because it's so three-dimensional in Greece, what's happening in Greece depends on what is happening in Eastern Turkey and Iran. It changes very quickly with position. And this is a big advantage to see other processes like rotations and so on. In, in Tibet and Nevada, it is very two-dimensional. It's the same all the way across these places. There's nothing, not much variation. In Greece, there's tremendous variation, which is a huge help. But, uh, and because of that, the faults change rapidly. That's what I meant. The, and the final reason why Greece has been so influential is because of the quality of the observations which exist in Greece. And this is as important as everything else. And this is the final point I want to make. And when I come back to saying, okay, I've been... The story I've given you is not my story. This is a story put together by my colleagues, by me, by my, my, some people in this room as well, and I want to point that out. So firstly, Nick Ambrose's, who is an academician here, essentially invented the whole business of looking at historical earthquakes. This is enormously important. We know in great detail what's happening now. We don't know if that was typical of the last thousand years. Now we do because of the work of Ambrose's, which is a tremendous work of scholarship. Uh, and it's because of him we have the kind of confidence in the longer time period, which you simply cannot have in places like Nevada or Utah or Tibet. The, the historical record doesn't exist. Okay? So that was very important. Uh, the next thing which is really important is its geodesy. I've relied again and again and again on the GPS. And the, the person who really started this was George Vase, who many of you will know, who was the first person to really realize that observations based from space can tell you in enormous detail what is happening on the Earth. You can measure how fast your fingernails are growing now from space. This is trivial stuff done by students in their first year in Cambridge now. This is completely routine, right? And that was, he was the person who really had the original insight in this whole thing. His work was carried on heroically by Harry Spilirius and Dimitris Paradisis at Zografu, uh, and because of them, we have these fantastic maps we can, in, in Greece of a quality which is really superb. Um, and very, very detailed. What else matters? We need to look at the faults, and you need to know what the faults look like on the ground, and that means you have to visit a lot of these places and do very detailed surveys of them. I want to particularly uh, thank Spiro Pavlidis, who's here, whose whole career has been looking at these things in enormous detail, looking at the landscape, understanding how the landscape is telling you how these things change with time. This is like learning a new language. Most of us, most people will go to the, the countryside and, and see the landscape and think this is nothing to do with me. It's interesting, there's a mountain, there's a river, who cares? Spiro looks at this stuff and he says, okay, you can read this language, he understands it. It's telling you how the landscape evolves. So this is a, a, an enormously important insight. We are at sea level. And I want the person in the audience I want to thank here for this is Stathis Syros from Patras. And he has spent his, most of his career looking at the movements of the sea level with other colleagues. But again, enormous amount of dedicated work looking very carefully at what's going up, what's going down, and, and how fast that's happening. That's very important. If you want to see what's happening underground, the third dimension, the only way is seismology. And Greece has committed has contributed enormously here. I've just got to draw attention to two things. Um, Thanasis Ganas on the, on the left from the National Observatory did, has, has led a lot of work on 
on looking at these earthquakes in detail in Greece, looking at the sh what it's telling you about the faults. Uh, and Starcia Kiratsia Thessaloniki has looked at them on, using more global data here, but it's a co continued effort over many years which has created such a wonderful database of material that we all use on this area here. And finally, my friend Kostas Sinatis here, Draws, makes me say that in the end everything depends on the Hellenic Trench. If the Hellenic Trench was not there, Greece wouldn't have anywhere to move to. You couldn't push Greece out over the Mediterranean without the conveyor belt going underneath it. Right? You need that free surface in order to be able to do that. And we've done a lot of work. This is Kostas looking like an academician at the top and underneath less respectable in the field with uh, my friend Philip England, who was admitted to the Academy in, in, in 2019 in this, this uh, same role. And uh, the only reason I've not talked much about that is because Philip talked a lot about it in his talk in, in 2019. But again, this has enormous implications for generation of tsunamis in the Eastern Mediterranean and, of course, the whole mechanics of how this thing works. So I've singled out various people. Now each of these people of course have their own colleagues, their own students, they're not the only people but who've, who've done this either. This is, but I want you to have the impression that this has been a joint effort. You know, our understanding of Greece is the result of lots of people putting in very high quality effort over many, many years to and sharing this information so that we can all use it. What I've talked about is far more than any one person can do in their career. I hope that was obvious, right? A single person cannot do seismology and geology and geomorphology and looking at uplift and geodesy. It, life's too short. So you have to talk to each other and rely on this. And Greece has been particularly fortunate in having people of this quality and this stamina, really, to just keep going on this difficult, demanding work for so long. And it really, we have reached the, reaped the benefits. And so um, we all have an awful lot to thank Greece for in our understanding of this subject. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor Jackson, for a wonderful and most insightful talk. Uh, we, uh, we here in Greece thought we were living in an interesting place, but uh, we didn't know how interesting it really was. And uh, uh, probably speaking for people who have been in earthquake regions and suffered earthquakes, uh, we might have liked a less interesting place <laughs> to live in. Anyway, uh, we are very grateful and, and the Academy of Athens welcomes you and wishes you every success in the continuation of your work. Kyrie Sinadarfe, sas ευχαριστούμε για την εξαιρετικά ενδιαφέρουσα ομιλία σας. Η Ακαδημία Αθηνών σας καλωσορίζει με ιδιαίτερη τιμή και σας απευθύνει θερμές ευχές για την επιτυχή συνέχιση του έργου σας. Λύεται η συνεδρία. Ευχαριστώ. <Κι>